Now, everything old is new again. America's entertainment pop culture talk show. It may well possess a rudimentary intelligence. We try to think, but nothing happens. Felt a great disturbance in the force. Hello, I'm Mr. Ray. Come on, Mark, like a dog for me. Meet me. Where's the goodies? Leave the gun. Take the cannoli. I'll bet you wouldn't have done anything like this if Mom and Dad were here. You filthy criminal. Excuse me while I whip this out. Go ahead. Make my day. Here are your hosts, Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. Hi, this is Art Shamsky from the 1969 Mets, and you're listening to Everything Old is New Again. Hi, everybody. This is Ron Swoboda uh, of the 1969 Miracle Mets, uh, author of uh, Here's the Catch, a memoir of the Miracle Mets and more, and you're listening to Everything Old is New Again. Got cut off there. Everything Old is New Again. This is Douglas Viviani. Uh, welcome back to Everything Old is New Again. We're having a, uh, a, a week here where we're going to introduce a teammate of those two individuals, an original Met who in 1962 began his 18-year professional baseball career at the age of 17 with the brand new then New York Mets was the sole representative of the Mets in the 1965 All-Star Game. Four years later, he became a member of the Miracle Mets, hit a home run in Game 3 of the World Series, in which the Mets won uh, the, the, the Game 5-0 and, of course, uh, uh, won the, the whole World Series there. When he retired in 69 at age 34, he was the all-time Mets leader in eight offensive categories and has since been elected to the New York Mets Hall of Fame. He's now released... An autobiography, which I highly recommend, The Last Miracle, My 18-Year Journey with the Amazing New York Mets. Ed Creampool, welcome to Everything Old is New Again. Well, thank you very much. And up here in uh, beautiful Florida and just enjoying life. Oh, that's good to hear. It's good to good to hear that you're, you're healthy and, and well, and we'll get into that because we know you had a health issue that you talk about in the book a little bit there uh, and with respect to a kidney uh, transplant, and, and that was, well, we might as well just jump to that. There was an amazing story uh, sort of in the hospital about that. Uh, you had a kidney issue due to some diabetes, and, and tell us a little bit about what happened with the, the, the twist there in the hospital. Well, after 35 years of uh, having the, you know, kidney problems, uh, I lost a kidney and I had to get a donor and it took me about three years to find one and the difficult sure and finally came about and uh, it really became a tremendous uh, successful operation because we, so we actually saved another man along the way when we were looking for a kidney. My donor had volunteered to to give me one, but we uh, went to the hospital and found out that uh, another donor was looking for one. His wife, who was willing to donate to him, was not a match. She couldn't give it to him. Looks like we were going to lose him, but uh, my donor uh, was a perfect match for him. So what we did was we switched his wife, who was a, a donor that was able to give me hers, and uh, he took my guy. So we wound up saving two people, four people had operations. They all went well, we were all friendly together and walking around. And I'm very happy to hear that. I know we were going through a struggle there a little bit. We had heard through the news about that. And, and what a great story, what a great uh, ending to a very difficult situation for sure. Um, and and uh, I wanted to, uh, to twist a little bit here or pivot a little bit to 1976. I want to show you a little something here. And it does relate. I have a little diary here. When I was 14 years old, I used to write in my daily activities. And almost every day, you would see a box score. I know it's small. I don't know if you can see it there. But there's a yeah. box score I would take out of Newsday every day. And I uh, was such a big fan. I'd see, you know, Felix Mian, Joe Torrey, Dave Kingman, uh, Jerry Grody. And, of course, Ed Cranepole uh, almost every uh, game one of your best seasons, unfortunately. That season, the Mets had 86 wins. The the season uh, three years before, in 73, you had, uh, I think it was 82 wins and went on to the World Series. 86 was not, a, not enough to win the division that year, so it's, uh, it, it's, it's an odd thing. But I did want to also show you, and then it all ties together here. In that same year, but and I was a fan my whole life, but it just turned out that 76 was a banner year for me. Uh, I went to the old-timers game at Chase Stadium, 
I don't know how I got this Diamond Club menu, but there's a Diamond Club menu uh, that I had, and I was happy enough and privileged enough to get autographs of Ed Charles, Jim Hickman, and none other than uh, Ed Cranepaw. I don't know if you see your autograph there, but it's there. Yeah, it's a little little faded, but still there. Exactly. Uh, so we've met before. Let's go there with it a long uh, well, way. That means we both like to eat, so that's, that's a good thing. <laughs> number one. Number two, we both love baseball, and that's a gift that you've given to me that I in turn have transferred down to my son. And so I wanted to just take a moment and thank you for uh, for all the time and effort that you put into your career. And, you know, you do affect people without sort of knowing it, I guess you'd say. You were all over Long Island and, and bank openings and McDonald's openings or whatever it might be. There are different things that Ed Crampo was at and everybody really would flock uh, there. Uh, how does that make you feel in some ways all these years later that uh, <laughs> you, you still have an effect on people and it's a long-lasting Well, one. I still run into fans all over New York. I just came back from New York over the summer. My wife and I took a trip up to see old friends. We saw a lot of people in New York that still follow us, and uh, it's really good to say hello to them. New Yorkers are great. They're great sports fans. They support the Mets. They've been loyal to them since 1962. And uh, unfortunately for this year, it was a struggle for them. They haven't made it. It's a long year, and hopefully they can rebuild fast and get back into the pennant race. Absolutely. Let's take a look at your bio autobiography, The Last Miracle. You speak about, you know, team after team that you played on, player after player, which is great. I just love it. It takes you behind the scenes, and you're very honest, and, and it's a unique read for any baseball fan, certainly for a Mets fan. Uh, but let's go to the beginning a little bit there. You started at 17 years old. You... Uh, uh, had a manager, Casey Stingle, which we all, if we re remember back in the day, and the people from this show certainly remember, uh, uh, you know, Casey Stingle and all his antics after he, went with the, he was with the Yankees and a champion, came to the Mets uh, and promoted the Mets. And uh, part of that was a quote that he's known for saying about yourself, he's only 17, he runs like he's 30. Uh, whether that's a compliment or not, he, later on he did say something of the nature that uh, uh, that you certainly had the capability to be a, a, a tremendous or a athlete and a, a great player. Um, what was it like to play for Casey Stingle? Was he all fun and games like that, or was was he? Uh, seems to be an uh, at that time in his life may have been difficult to play for. I don't know. Well, he was he was actually easy to play for because he loved the young players, loved to develop them, loved them around him. And he would tell you stories from the old days. And, of course, he was having fun when the press was around because he was trying to take some of the pressure off the young players. He didn't have the ball club or the nucleus of players to really develop it into a championship team. So he took a couple of guys that he liked, worked with them consistently, and tried to improve them. And, of course, eventually the Mets came around and pretty quickly. When you look at it, we might have lost 100 games in seven years, but in seven years, we finally won a pennant. Exactly, and, and it's interesting in 62 how you were the person in your first game on September 22nd, uh, 1962, uh, defensively replacing or coming into a game at first base to replace none other than Hall of Famer, recent Hall of Famer, Gil Hodges. And then you go on to talk about in the book how much you respected that gentleman and how... Uh, what of a great leader he was. One example is uh, in the World Series, Casey Martin, a catcher, came up to uh, pinch hit for Tom Seaver, and uh, and Hodges whispers into Casey Martin's ear something we feel that he was uh, saying that he wanted him to bunt. Uh, can you tell us, uh, for even, even our amateur coaches of Little League, like myself, what something like that does or why that impressed you enough to mention that when you give an accolade to uh, to this manager, uh, uh, Gil Hodges? Why, why is that something? Well, that's in, in certain situations, you know, it's a difficult thing to do. J.C. Martin was a uh, part-time player, a third-string catcher. For him to be able to bunt in that situation, he had to convince him to do it. And, uh, you know, he did. He convinced everybody that their role was what their role was. You know, you fit into a role and you work at it. You, you produce during the course of the year. And we won as a team. And, uh, you know, that situation was key. He lays down the bunt. 
the relief pitcher throws the ball away down the right field line and we win the win a ball game. I mean, it's tremendous that you can win a World Series game, you know, on a uh, sacrifice bunt. It's also tremendous and amazing that we have Ed Cranepool with us here and everything old is new again, the author of The Last Miracle, my 18-year journey with the amazing New York Mets. We'll be back right here to continue on Everything Old is New Again. Meet the Mets, meet the Mets, step right up and greet the Mets. Bring your kiddies, bring your wife, guaranteed to have the time of your life, because the Mets are really sucking the ball, knocking those home runs over the wall. You're listening to Everything Old is New Again, America's entertainment pop culture talk show with Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. The author of The Last Miracle, My 18-Year Journey, with the amazing Mets, uh, back to it with Ed Cranepool. You mentioned in the book how you feel that uh, Gil Hodges sort of knew always uh, to make the right move and you know, knew baseball that well. You learned so much from him. You, you mentioned that in the uh, 1973 season when the Mets lost to the A's, how you feel that, that had Gil Hodges survived and not passed away and been managing that team, you feel you would have been successful in that World Series as well. I guess, is that part of the reason that he kind of knew the moves to make? What what was his influence on the team as opposed to a, a Yogi Berra who was more hands-off? Well, the thing with Gil was he had one set of rules and he played the game the same way every time. He wasn't looking to make any changes, especially drastically in a World Series. That game, George Stone was scheduled to pitch the sixth game. He should have pitched, would have pitched under Gil Hodges. He wouldn't have shortchanged um, Tom Seaver. Asking him to pitch in the sixth game was totally different from what he'd done his whole career. Seaver always worked on his fourth day. He was the pitcher out there, and he pitched no matter what the weather was. The other guy was going to be pushed aside. This wasn't his day to pitch. The next day was. He would have left him in in you know, in, in, to do whatever he wanted to do. And uh, if George Stone doesn't do well, we had Sean Seaver for the seventh game of the World Series, and I'll take my chances with the whole pitching staff, along with Tom, you know, Tom Seaver, to win the seventh game. And Tom Seaver on his proper rest, right? He he, he pitched that Correct. game without the proper rest. and Late in the season, it's crazy. He throws a lot of pitches, a lot of strikeouts, a lot of complete games. There's no reason to really short rest them come in. We didn't have to win the sixth game. Oakland did. Right. What a great point. Uh, and it's so interesting because, um, you know, when you're in the, the battle, you, you can't listen to the, the soldiers, so to speak, right, if you're the general. I mean, he was, uh, he was that type of person. He knew what he wanted. I know Seaver is a Hall of Famer, and back then we all know he was skilled and so forth, but he was not running the show. But it, I guess we're saying that, uh, uh, you know, Yogi Berra sort of let him run the show, and it's surprising to me in a way because Yogi had so many World Series, uh, World Series rings, but uh, not as a manager, right? No, no, Yogi didn't uh, let Siva run the show. show. Siva did not go into his office and ask, ask the pitch oh. on the sixth game. He knew he had to pitch the seventh. Yogi went to Tom Siva to ask him. That's a different story. When you ask a Hall of Fame pitcher if he will pitch or not, they're not going to say no. There's not a pitcher around that's going to say no. Siva said, yes, I'll pitch, but uh, it's not my day. My day is on Sunday. George Stone should have pitched. He should have never been asked. He wouldn't have been asked, and he wouldn't have pitched. Stone would have got the ball, and if we win, if we lose. He won seven games in a row. What what makes you believe he can't win his eighth game in a row? Holy smokes. I, 12 and 3 that year. Yeah, I, I cannot believe I did had the story wrong there all these years. Yeah. I thank you for correcting that. Holy smokes, and that's why you want to read 
the last miracle because uh, you do get inside all of this uh, talking about uh, player after player. Uh, you, you love Jerry Grody because uh, there's a quote there from Johnny Bench, and uh, Johnny Bench says if Jerry Grody was the the catcher or was on the Reds, he'd be the catcher, and and uh, Johnny Bench says he'd be playing third base. I don't know if he's being facetious or just being nice, but I know growing up watching Jerry Grody, you of course played with Jerry Grody day after day. Uh, a yeah. rough and ready, down to earth, uh, real, real uh, quality defensive player, and a clutch man at the at the bat, right? Uh, you might you might not like Jerry Grody personally or as a friend to go to dinner with, but he was the best catcher in baseball, and uh, he was number one. And Johnny Bunch knew it, but Johnny Bunch was a better hitter than Jerry Grody defensively. You couldn't find a guy that could block the ball, throw the runners out. Do everything to pencil me that a great catcher does. And to receive all of Siva, Kuzman, Matt, like Gentry, Ryan, all these pitchers through the years that Grody uh, caught, I, I, it can't be uh, just a coincidence that the Mets had such great uh, pitching. Uh, you know, uh, at that time, the catchers called the game, right? So he had to have such tremendous skill in bringing these pitchers along, even though maybe he was cant- a little cantankerous in the in the dugout, right? I don't think the uh, management ever called the pitch when Jerry Grody was catching. It was always between Grody and the and the pitcher, and they they made their uh, game plan and they they worked it out to, together. And if you had to ask somebody how the pitcher was doing, you went to the catcher because he knew by catching the ball whether the ball was moving, or whatever. That's all you had to do. He was a great catcher. Exactly. It drives me crazy now when you see these catchers uh, looking over to the dugout or pressing buttons on their knee and whatever, uh, you uh, know, getting the signals. And, like, that's half the fun for a catcher, too. Forget that it's it's their job, right? I mean, you, you want to be a battery mate, not uh, have somebody in the dugout or somebody from up high and uh, look at him with binoculars or something telling you what pitch to pitch, right? It's crazy. I, I've never seen a guy from the second deck or in the, in the dugout be able to call a pitcher. You can... The catcher can tell what a ball is doing, whether it's moving or not moving, and when to take a guy out. He's the best guy on the field for that. Absolutely. Uh, one last thing on Jerry Grody is one of my favorites, along with yourself. When at the end of the, every inning, if there was a strikeout, and it would happen many times with your pitching staff, uh, if if the team was coming from the uh, adversary, let's say the other team was coming from the dugout by uh, the third baseline, he would roll that ball to the mound towards the first baseline just so that that pitcher would have to walk another five steps to get the ball to get to the mound and five steps back every inning just and i believe it's my understanding that he felt that that was something that would make that pitcher a little more tired just a little bit more of an advantage right i mean all the work yeah, you're tonight, right but... you're 100 percent correct he was trying to annoy the other guy <laughs> was, and uh, make him work a little harder yes he was a piece of work but so are you i mean you you were sent down well first of all you're an all-star in 65 unfortunately didn't get to see uh, the play in the game but sitting on the bench in 65 with Mays and some of those others uh for i believe let's see you must have been like 22 years old or something like that uh how is that how is that now 20 you must have been 20 how, what kind of experience was that i was 20 and i'll tell you what all these guys with the exception of probably johnny callison and myself they all made the hall of fame and he was a pretty good player but uh, it was a great, great thing to do. He went out to Minneapolis. I didn't play. Gene Mock was the manager. He left a couple of guys on the bench, didn't play that game. So it was a long weekend in Minnesota. And, uh, you know, for the whole, my whole career, um, I, I held it against Gene Mock. And I tried, tried to do well against him every time we played. So when it came time to retire. I did get a call from Minnesota, and he was the manager and wanted me to come out there and play. And I chose to stay in New York and go into business and retired at that point. How about that? So when the uh, – I think he was the manager of the uh, Montreal Expos, Minnesota right? Um, uh, yeah, okay. But we, he was he was somebody that you just were not, were not going to uh, mm-hmm. forgive, so to I speak. Didn't, I didn't want him to get another shot at me. Good for you. Uh, and, and some people we've had on the, the show that you've been teammates with, we heard Art Shamsky and, and Ron Swoboda have nothing but great things to say about you and, and you in the dugout and uh, as a um, a pillar or just, a, you know, sort of, yeah, a pillar is a good word of, of the team. Just, you know, something that's standard, you know, that's there all the time, not standard, but somebody that's there and, and as the backbone, that's what I'm looking for. The backbone of the team, uh, you know, they they uh, you had a great camaraderie, a great 
uh, group of guys in 69, apparently, to still be in touch with Ron Svoboda, who did the forward to your book. Well, we're still friendly with a lot of people. I mean, uh, Art Shansky's a real good friend of mine. I see him all the time in New York and in Florida. And, you know, our guys were a close group of guys. We still contact. Leon Jones is a friend of ours down in Mobile. The club is still together. The Mets are, you know, maybe we'll make a comeback next year. Never know. <laughs> well, you know, they. I think the Mets are doing back to doing their old timers game uh, day again, right? So hopefully next well, we year. We did it last year. It was wonderful to have. This year there was nothing going on in New York, but maybe they needed something to motivate them. Why? Why not? I think it's a it's it's a nice day for the young players to be able to look back on the history of the team, but more importantly to maybe share. Uh, you know, a little piece of information that you still might be able to render out. Why, why, why wouldn't you list as someone as successful as, as uh, Ed Cranepool, who's written uh, The Last Miracle, uh, his autobiography, My 18-Year Journey with the Amazing New York Mets. You've got to read this book. Nothing Ed would enjoy more than getting his first Major League base hit. Line drive, base hit, going down the left field line for Ed Cranepool. He's on his way to second. And Greenpool is in, standing up with a double. Well, there is a moment to remember for 17-year-old Ed Greenpool. He hit the ball hard. A low liner between Ron Sano and the bag and down the left field line into the corner. A two-base hit. Oh, they're hollering and cheering and they're jumping in their seats. Where do they go? To meet the Mets! All the fans are true. All right, so Doug, people have been saying, hey, I could find you guys on YouTube. You have your own YouTube channel. I can find you on Facebook. But what about other social media? Do you exist anywhere else in the social media universe? Yes, we do. We're on Instagram and we're on Twitter. At the same thing, you go at E-O-N-A show. That's everything old is new again. The initials, right? So it's E-O-N-A show. And that's it, at E-O-N-A show. you got Instagram, Twitter, and I'll tell you, we post pictures, behind-the-scenes stuff, trivia questions, contests, notes about the show, so you have a lot of fun. Subscribe to us, friend us on Facebook if you can, and, and subscribe to the YouTube, and follow us on Twitter and Instagram. That's fun. I'm going to even start doing that. Ah, it might be worth your while. You can it's... actually know what we're going to do next week. <laughs> Good. <laughs> <It's>... <laughs> at E-O-N-A show. That's at E-O-N-A show. Now, back to America's entertainment pop culture talk show. Everything old is new again with Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. The Orioles have the tying run of third now. The lead run of first with one away. Straight away for him in the outfield. And there's a drive to right center. Swoboda comes up with it. The tag to third. Here comes Frank Robinson. The game is tied. Ron Swoboda making another sensational catch for the Mets. Hi, everybody. This is Ron Swoboda uh, of the 1969 Miracle Mets, uh, author of uh, Here's the Catch, a memoir of the Miracle Mets and more, and you're listening to Everything Old is New Again. Oh, welcome back to Everything Old is New Again. Wow, 1969, Ron Swoboda catching that catch that I think we still all can see in our mind's eye today if we're a baseball fan, and we had him on the show previously, a good friend of Ed Cranepool, even to this day, and teammate, of course, he presented the uh, forward to the book, uh, Cranepool's new book, The Last Miracle, My 18-Year Journey with the Amazing New York Mets. And there's so much more in this book than just baseball. And uh, it's just a great read and a lot of fun. I just remember back in those days, we all can go back, right, when baseball was uh, America's pastime and there was very little else to do. And you didn't want to do anything else but watch baseball around the clock, pay, play baseball, go out with your buddies and play baseball, talk about trades, and uh, talk about the, the Miracle Mets who were 
in the basement for the first uh, eight years, so to speak, of their, uh, you know, their creation from 62 to 68 and then 69 really put it together. And, uh, and of course, uh, we're pretty good in 73. We'll talk about that a little bit as well. They made it to the World Series but lost to the Oakland A's. Boy, we've come a long way uh, from those days, and uh, we continue with uh, uh, with Ed Crample here. You know, a little piece of information that you still might be able to render out. Why why, why wouldn't you listen to someone as successful as, as uh, Ed Crample, who's written uh, The Last Miracle, uh, his autobiography, My 18-Year Journey with the Amazing New York Mets. You've got to read this book. It's an easy, quick read, too, because you write it in such a fan-friendly way. It's it's It, it was... Um, it had to be a labor of love, I guess. But how is that to write a biography? Did you go through the old di- di- uh, diaries like I have here? How did you remember all of those stories and all the various games and so forth that you talk about? Well, I've got a pretty good memory, and, and, and everything was coming back very easy. It was flowing easy. I wanted to do a book since Ralph Kiner just passed away. He was the last link to 1962, and I'm the last guy really now that uh, participated in 62 and stayed till 1980 and you had a lot to tell the people and we can still have some fun and I might do another book. I'd love to hear another book and, and maybe one chapter or something would, would be interesting to hear from someone that has been experienced and been so successful yourself, but also had hard times for 1970. For example, uh, you went back down to the minor leagues. So you were struggling and came back up, I believe it was 70, and came back up in 71 and had a, a great season. Maybe we could talk a little bit about running up against difficult times like that. Yeah, 70, you went down, I believe, in 71, you came back, you batted 280 and 14 homers, 58 RBIs. I mean, you, you came back from adversity. That's got to take some intestinal fortitude, no? Well, it, it says something about yourself that you're going down to the minor leagues to work on things and uh, try to improve yourself and get back to the major leagues. You can only do it by hard work, and I did, and got back and played another 10 years or so, and uh, it was a lot of fun. But Gil was a tough manager. He had one set of rules, he played his way, or he hit the highway. So you didn't have to be his friend. You just had to enjoy the way you managed, and, uh, you know, you played that way, and that's the way it was going to be. Now, now, speaking of Gil Hodges and some of the others, like Willie Mays you play with, of course, Tom Sevo, a bunch of Hall of Famers, uh, Joe Torrey. Um, is there – I don't know if this is a fair question, but is there something that you have found in the Hall of Famers that you've played with and, and or are they just successful – individuals like yourself of course that um that can translate to us as whether we're baseball fans or little league coaches just uh you know teaching their kids or in general in life in general that there's something in common with all these rather successful individuals like yourself as an entrepreneur restaurant owner and so forth is there some common uh commonality that uh, you know that we can learn from you and from the people that you've been surrounded with in your career well, you got to re- respect who's in charge and, and believe in what they're going to tell you. And that's what we all believe about Gil Hodges. You might not like him personally and want to go to dinner with him, but you're going to respect him on the field. He's running the show and he's got the rules. And he was tough, but he did, treated everybody the same way. He didn't have anything that was tricky. He just played the game the way he was supposed to play every day. You knew your role. You had to accept it. And you played that way. And we all played under Gil Hodges the way he wanted us to. He had to respect him, and uh, he he led us. And I'll tell you what, there was nothing wrong with the way he was doing it because we were winning, and that's the important thing. Abs- winning is the most important thing. Abs- absolutely. You know, I, I, and, um, you know, I, I, it's interesting because uh, later on in your career, you, you – it seemed to me keep kept on learning more and more and more about your craft because uh, and a great lesson for us all in, in that in baseball you weren't past your prime by any means but you had played for 10 years 10 11 12 years to me before the, the 74 through 77 seasons which in my of course you had a great season in 71 as well but just saying th- those years later on in your career 
uh, when you were your late 20s, early 30s. Again, that's not old by any means. But in baseball parlance, it's a little more advanced. You've been playing for quite a while. So all of a sudden, you have these tremendous, not all of a sudden, but you're building yourself up to have these tremendous, really good years, great batting average, you know, some good uh, good home run totals for the time and and RBIs. So, you know, did you feel that you were constantly learning the game? You, you didn't feel like you would lay back on your laurels, right? I mean, did that time in the minors give you some, some inspiration to do that? Well, you, what happened was I caught up with the league. I was 17 when I was in the major leagues, facing a Hall of Fame as I go back to Drumsdale and Gibson, Bob Veal, all these great pitches in the National League. And then I was trying to learn against those guys. You don't make a living pitching against these Hall of Famers. But I started to develop. I got older. I got more mature. I caught up with the league. And I was ready to compete with them on the same level. And, of course, I got better. But it seemed like I was around so long. People said he's got to be way over the hill. And they start diminishing your role. But I became a great pinch hitter. I knew how to hit. I, I led the National League in pinch hitting five years in a row, hitting over 400. I set an all-time record pinch hitting. I was 17 for 35 one year. Still a record that's being held with anybody over 30 at bats as a pinch hitter. So it got easier because I started to re rely on my own experience and was able to compete against these guys. I'm going to have to stop there just for a moment. It is a privilege and honor to have Ed Cranepool, uh, our third guest from the 1969 championship New York Mets on Everything Old is New Again. Art Shamsky and Ron Swoboda were here. And now Ed Cranepool, we're just having a great time. The uh, the camaraderie between these uh, gentlemen uh, just uh, never ended. Tom Seaver had been known to say that all else fails. You can remember me as a New York Meta champion from 1969. He was so proud of that, as are all of us New Yorkers. But uh, it goes beyond that. It's a great story of uh, of overcoming odds and how to use your discipline and your talents and and work as a team together to achieve what appears to be impossible. <laughs> Ed Cranepool, The Last Miracle, my 18-year journey with the amazing New York Mets. We'll be back on Everything Old is New Again in a few moments right here, uh, right now. Just uh, don't go anywhere. We'll be back right this. Everything Old is New Again. <laughs> And you're listening to Everything Old is New Again with Douglas Viviani and David Cohn. This is Terrence Winter, writer and executive producer of The Sopranos, creator and executive producer of Boardwalk Empire and The New Vinyl on HBO. And you're listening to my friends Douglas Viviani and David Cohen on Everything Old is New Again. Hey, it's Dr. Peter Weller. I'm here with my friends David Cohen and Douglas Viviani on Everything Old is New Again. One of my favorite shows. And I may, I may not be the most interesting man in the world, but I'm one of them. Hello, everyone. I'm Dee Dee Servino, co-author of Pino Pasta and Parties, along with your favorite good fella. Paul Servino. And we are here to tell you that you should be listening every day, all day long. Wake up to it and sleep with it. Everything old is new again with Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. Hi, this is Paul McGann, the eighth doctor, and you're listening to Everything Old is New Again. This is Bobby Clark for Everything Old is New Again and the nostalgic look to the future. This is Everything Old is New Again, America's entertainment pop culture talk show with Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. Uh, this is Skip Lockwood. I'm a major league pitcher for 12 and a half years. I am author of a new book called Insight Pitch. My life is a major league closer. I'm happy to be on a program. Everything old is new again, and I guess that applies to me. It's Doug McGraw gets the sign, goes into the motion. Here's the two-strike pitch. Swung on, hit on the ground toward first. Milner has the ball. Looks to McGraw. It's over. The New York Mets have won the pennant. The New York Mets have won the pennant. The New York Mets have won the pennant, and this is a wild scene. Fans are pouring out onto the field. A 
mad scene at Shea Stadium as the New York Mets have won the National League. Uh, how about that? Uh, another team that... Uh, how about that? A teammate of Ed Cranepool, Skip Lockwood from days after the championships and then the the championship of the National League, if you will, 1973. What a heartbreaking year that was with Willie Mays on that team and Ed Cranepool and so many others, Tom Seaver, John Matlack, Felix Mian, Jerry Grody, Bud Harrelson, <laughs> go on and on and on, Cleon Jones. Uh, a shame that that team did not win and just shows you what leadership can do for you. And, of course, they were not led by Gil Hodges, who had passed away by that time, but by Yogi Berra, who I think uh, we all know and, and love, but may not have been the inspirational leader that was needed as the Mets needed in 69. So leadership is important. We're here on Everything Old is New again. One more session here with Ed Cranepool, his book, The Last Miracle, My 18-Year Journey. With the amazing New York Mets, of course, he's an original Met from 1962 and played for 18 seasons. Amazing career and just having so much fun. Fellow, uh, I guess we'd say adopted New Yorker, and uh, he was lived on Long Island for so many years. We would run into him as kids at uh, one opening or another of a bank or of a McDonald's or whatever it might be, and uh, strip stores and you know malls and things. And there he'd be, uh, omnipresent uh, gentleman uh, that was always available to sign an autograph and say hello. A pleasure uh, to welcome back uh, here. Everything old is new again. Uh, and we'll continue with uh, with Ed Cranepool. Now, uh, as someone that coaches, you know, kids uh, growing up, we know most, if not all of the kids that I ever see on the field coaching these years. Uh, now, I have a son that's 11. And, and um, it, you know, they're... Let's be honest, they're not going to be pros, all right? But um, there's got to be lessons that are learned on the field. And, of course, I'm not going to tell them they're not going to be pros, but I'm just saying they, they seem to love the game and want to, want to learn. Is there something that uh, our listeners that are coaching, that are playing, that have kids, can can sort of relay to, to, to them from yourself uh, that, you know, can help them either learn how to hit or learn how to understand this game that even if you're out seven out of 10 times, you know, 70% of the time, you're a success in this game. How do you deal with it? Can you teach us a little bit how to, t to tell these kids either how to hit and or deal with adversity? You have to learn the fundamentals of the game and you play it the same way every time. The game doesn't change. You know, what might change is the players playing it. Uh, but the players should know defensively how to play each position learn them all offensively learn how to hit know your own strike zone swing at the pitches that are in that strike zone that you've created and once you do that you become a more experienced player for it and you become a better hitter but practice makes perfect you got to work with your trade go out every day think it's a new day and start all over and you're starting from scratch and do the same thing, basically saying do the same thing over and over right. again, you know, when especially when you're batting, but of course fielding as well, the same same goes, the same thing said. I think it's interesting right. that you say in the book, and this is what's great about this book, is all of this, by the way, is in the book and, and more uh, of these stories that you could take out of The Last Miracle, my 18-year journey with the Amazing Mets by uh, Ed Cranepool. Like, just a little story like I wouldn't know that was so interesting as a fan, Um you know, Ralph Kiner was an amazing hitter. I think he had a 10-year career, he, he, but he, he led the leagues, uh, I don't know, quite a number of times in home runs. And, uh, you know, we know him as an announcer, but he had certainly so much information as you do to relay to people. And on a, I think it was on a plane flight or two on the way back from various, uh, uh, you know, venue uh he would try to give some advice to maybe uh, ron Swoboda and some others here and there and then the mets management came down on him apparently and told him not to do so isn't that odd you know that you don't want to learn something from someone that's been there before and been successful like yourself yeah i don't know why but i've never encouraged uh, ralph to work with the players he wanted to he enjoyed working with the guys and he had a lot a lot to offer but um, they didn't want him on the field. They wanted him to broadcast. And 
you know, he stayed away for his own uh, uh, job uh, security. So I don't blame him, but uh, he was great to talk to and a great guy to be around. And he could have offered a lot more. Well, and sir, I agree 100 percent. And I tell you what, though, your loss, so to speak, as a team was our gain because on the and you didn't get a chance to hear, of course, the broadcast because you're playing. But holy smokes, I learned so much of the game from him in his broadcast. I would listen as you saw my diary. You know, I would listen every single game, watch every game. And he really taught me so much about the game, as did Bob Murphy and Lindsey Nelson. But uh, boy, um, what a shame. I, my message would be read this book. The Last Miracle, 18-Year Journey with the Amazing New York Mets by Ed Cranebull, because you will learn quite a bit. And that's what our show's about. Everything old is new again. We look back at the past and show that, you know, what from, happened from the past is the foundation for what people are doing today. Like you said, baseball, so to speak, maybe they're pitching a little faster. Maybe they're doing different things. They have more pitchers pitching in a particular game. But the ball's still coming in, and it's still round, and the bat is still round, and you still got to, you know, hit it head on, right? I mean, it's, <laughs> what do you they think of same right now. They they sped the game back up. They made the pitchers throw the ball. The hitters get in the box and swing, and that's the fun of the game. And I'm glad the fans came out and supported the game. And they they're watching a great product. And uh, the pitchers are the same today as they were. They're a little bigger, a little stronger, but we still had Hall of Famers back in the '60s. The game is great. I hope the fans enjoy it. Hope the Mets win next year. And go out and buy my book. I hope, hope uh, you enjoy it. Absolutely. Let's just finish with a quote from your book here. Uh, and I want to tie it, tie it all in in a moment. That as for me and recalling uh, of my story, I guess it's safe to say that I was a survivor, a survivor in more ways than one, from never being traded to finding a kidney donor and then having my wife come through her surgery. I had my share of miracles both on and off the field. And as uh, many times as I mentioned throughout this story that I uh, was the odd man out. I look at things differently now that with the guys they traded to play first base, none of them lasted as long as I did. I finally realized uh, that I wasn't the odd man out. I was the odd man in. Uh, I think that's a great ending. Boy, that was uh, sort of touching because it is a theme throughout the book. How'd you come up with that ending? Well, it, I thought it was fitting. I mean, I laughed for a long time. They kept trying to replace me, but the one thing they couldn't do with me, they couldn't hit. I was a consistent player and could have played more, should have played more, but you know what? It is what it is. And you hung in there, and you hung in there certainly with physical issues as well later on in life. Uh, we admire your work on the field and certainly off. You deserve the time Thank in you. Florida now, the retirement. I have my treasure here of my autograph of Ed Cranepool. Now, even better, I have this uh, interview with uh, with a great man that I really had a pleasure, has the pleasure of being on Everything Old is New. Again, the last miracle, my 18-year journey with the amazing New York Mets, Ed Cranepool. Thank you so much for being on our show. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you. You too. And looks like that's about it. We've got uh, just a smidge bit of time here to uh, just let you know that it's um, just a pleasure to broadcast uh, to you and bring you guests like we just have, bring you characters that we do, tell stories. Hopefully you're enjoying the stories every so often that we tell uh, and just having a good time here and everything old is new again. We're missing David Cohen right now, but he'll be back next week and we will continue next week with uh, more fun thrills and adventures. We like to say on everything old is new again, but uh, let us know what you think and what you like. And maybe if there's anything that we don't like, uh, let us know in a nice way, but certainly uh, feel free to communicate with us and we can be found that everything old is new again. Dot biz. That's everything old is new again. Dot biz. In the alternative, you want to send us a note, old new again at AOL.com. Old new again at AOL.com. Let's continue the fun next week here on Everything Old is New Again. The 2 1 pitch. There's a fly ball hit out to the left, waiting is Jones, the Mets of the World Champion. Gary Kuzman being mobbed. Look at this scene. He nearly tore this ballpark apart when the Mets clinched their division pennant against the Cardinals. Here's the Met locker room. The Mets had five runs, seven hits, no errors. The Orioles, three runs, five hits, two errors. 
Sport Magazine has declared Don Clendenin as the outstanding player of the series, and he wins himself a new dodge. And it was a come from behind victory for the Mets today. They were trailing three nothing. The celebration of the new world champions of baseball, the New York Mets, the final score. New York, five runs, seven hits, and no errors. Baltimore, three runs, five hits, and two errors. Meet the Mets, meet the Mets. Step right up and greet the Mets. Bring your kiddies, bring your wife. Guaranteed to have the time of your life because the Mets are really sucking the ball. Knocking those home runs over the wall. East side, west side, everybody's coming down to meet the M-E-T-S Mets of New 